What is up, guys? Welcome to the Tony and Dakota podcast. Today, we got another virtual guest that Tony's going to introduce. This is Ryan Esberg. He markets himself as a full-time shoe reseller, and uh, he's created a lot of content. I was looking through all his Instagram stuff, kind of doing some last-minute research. I'm like, wow, they sell a lot of shoes. It's not a joke. It's a legitimate business. In fact, it looks like he's in his warehouse today. He's got a pretty awesome setup there. Uh, thanks for coming on, Ryan. We appreciate you. Hey, I appreciate you having me on. I'm looking forward to chopping it up today. So what is your shoe reselling business look like? Because I saw you had put that you had sold over 41,000 pairs of shoes. And then I was looking over some of your Instagram images and it was looking like you had like entire walls of shoes, like we were going to war or something and you were building a barricade. Yeah. Um, so I guess the 10 second story is we started uh, shoe reselling in 2017 and we saw other people doing it. We decided to give it a try. And if we could pay all of our bills that first month, we were going to keep doing it. If we did not, we were going to go get the job as a bartender, a job as in the cafe or whatever it took. Uh, we paid all our bills that first month and we haven't looked back. Um, our our warehouse that you see behind me is my basement in my home in uh, in the woods in Maine. We've had warehouses in the past and uh, we really enjoy working from home. Um, we've got a little, almost two year old and, uh, another, our second child is due in November. So we really like to build our business out of our home. Um, when we first started, we had no idea what we were doing, sold a couple of shoes out of our closet, then started asking a lot of questions, uh, got some answers, tried a bunch of stuff. And when it's working, we pour gas on it. We're not romantic to anything that's not working. And, now, present day, we run a multi-million dollar business out of our home. Wow. Aren't aren't shoe resellers kind of, isn't kind of a saturated market? Like I see so many people who are like, yeah, I'm going to resell shoes. And then you being one of the main guys, were you worried at the beginning about being able to acquire enough market share to even be able to have a legitimate business? Were you like, man, I think we're just getting lucky or were you like, no, I'm going to figure out the science and strategy and we're going to grow this thing. Yeah. We we've always had the drive, but we're also, uh, we back that drive up with data. So that's a very good question to ask is like, man, uh, there's a lot of people doing what we do, or there's a lot of people doing uh, the volume that we want to do. Is there room for us? And so we try. And then when we hit a goal, we push it a little bit further and we push it a little bit further. I mean, the reality is, over 23 billion pairs of shoes are created every single year. There's only 8 billion people on the planet. I, I'd i be hard to find. I'd be hard to find one person that, I mean, even the homeless guy on the streets wearing a pair of shoes. So like the reality is there's not enough people willing to put in the effort for it to, to prevent anyone who wants to do this uh, from hitting big goals. And when I say big goals, I'm talking everything from the house that I'm in right now is paid for by shoe reselling, the cars in the driveway. Uh, you know, my almost two year old has a bank account with five figures in it right now, um, you know, for her future. The reality is you can make a significant amount of money by doing the absolute basics because a lot of people just don't do the basics. And you keep uh, you keep saying we who is we I'm assuming your wife. Yeah, yeah, my beautiful wife uh, is upstairs. She's she's got the hardest job on the planet. She's she's uh, our little boy is due in November. We're in the last uh, you know uh, trimester, so she's upstairs resting while our firstborn is napping. So it's us two, and then uh, it was us two for years, and then we've uh, in the last two years have started building out teams to help us source, teams to help us process, um, and so there is a a team involved in it now. Mm -hmm. How did you guys decide in the beginning who was going to do what? And then did you guys like start fighting about that at all? Like, hey, no, I'm doing this. No, this is my job. And then like start pointing responsibility. And then my second part to that question is like, did it start to like when you get frustrated in one area, did it go over into your guys' relationship? Very good question. I think we, uh, Lindsay and I started this business while we were dating. Now we're married, uh, you know, and have uh, one child with a second on the way. So like, We've gone through the the classic um, relationship struggles when you're when you're growing a business. But one thing is very good. We're always honest with each other and how we're feeling. We get a lot of sleep and we lean into each other's strengths. Lindsay is absolutely the uh, brains behind the operation. She's very good with numbers. Um, that's one of my weaknesses. So she takes over and runs all the financials, runs all the numbers. 
I'm very good about uh, building, you know, building teams, building uh, what the business could look like. And then we melt, we melt, we mold those two together. Um, when we, when there's a weakness that we both have, we ask a lot of questions of people who have done what we've done or have done uh, what we want to do. And then we learn it. We put in the sweat equity to learn uh, what, where our weaknesses are. But when it comes to uh, us being in a relationship and coming together, we both have, we're both agree on what the goals are. And then we lean into our strengths in terms of uh, specificity and growing the business. Did you hire people uh, at some point? Did you decide that you like needed an additional person on the team? And then outside of that, what does everything look like as far as the vendors you use, as far as the relationships you have with these shipping companies now? Like, I'm sure some of those relationships have changed and you've looked into like ways to save more money doing more bulk with them. So walk us through like no employees to maybe some contractors, vendors, and different relationships that you built. Yeah. For if you, so if you're listening to this, like we sold over a million dollars in shoes by ourselves. Um, but then we realized you can hire out, buy back your time, hit slightly bigger goals, but still have that free time, um, you know, to spend all, we, we spend a lot of free time daily with each other and, and with our child uh, that we also work seven days a week. So we're getting very good about creating efficiencies in our business. With respect to your question, we realized that if we hired someone to clean the shoes, we would save the time us cleaning the shoes. Now we had, we had waited until we cleaned tens of thousands of pairs of shoes ourselves. Um, that's when we were doing used shoes. Then we hired people out to list. Um, and now most recently in the last 12 to 13 months, we're building out teams to actually go out and source. When you say vendors, um, we always build our business in a way that is very repeatable. So like we buy our shoes from stores where anyone can walk into the store and buy the shoes for the same price we do. And then uh, we sell them on marketplaces that anyone has access to. So we're in control of our business seven days a week, rather than sometimes when you hear about sneaker resellers, they get like this backdoor deal on the new release or you get this backdoor deal. And that is true some cases, but what happens when you don't have that deal anymore? You don't have a business. So we build our entire business, literally walking into Nike outlets and buying shoes, walking into retail locations, buying shoes, walking into thrifts, buying shoes. We get the same price everyone else does. And then because it's, uh, it, we are able to do it seven days a week, we can build out teams that can uh, make a lot of money sourcing shoes for us in terms of shipping with respect to the last thing you said uh, we use the same rates that USPS uh, offers that UPS offers that FedEx offers again building our business uh, so it's very repeatable yeah I love that too because I feel like everybody uh, wants to find like you know the niche and find this new thing of like oh man you know I want to find something that nobody else is doing it's like why we'll just find what everybody else is doing and then like uh, find a process a system that you can do this and replicate no matter what nobody can take it away from you because it's out there I mean they're not going to just throw away their entire business model to the consumers but then if you're relying on one person to do anything whether you're a music artist whether you're you know a YouTuber and you're relying on YouTube or one source I mean then they have control and power over you uh, so yeah, I love that. And I love that it's not like this novel idea. It's like, no, dude, I'm taking what works and I'm building a system and a process around it. Yeah. I mean, basically what you're saying, and if for everyone that's listening to this, I mean, it applies to a bunch of different markets, but we're obviously talking about shoe reselling. We're finding an undervalued asset in one marketplace. We're providing ba value by buying that asset in that marketplace at the price that they want to sell it for. And then we're presenting it in another marketplace where it holds, holds more value. Now, sometimes we increase the value by cleaning the shoes or we increase the value by creating um, convenience. So like a mom with three kids could absolutely put all three kids in the car, drive all around the state to all the different outlets trying to find the shoes that their kids want, or they could just pop online, buy the shoes from me. I can have them dropped off at her door and she doesn't have to have the kids in the car, you know, going crazy all over the place. And it, that, that's all it is. I mean, a lot of people in our, our business try to make it more complicated, but there's so many people over here in this undervalued marketplace that want to sell you their shoes at a great price. And all you got to do is put them over in the marketplace where people are willing to pay a little bit more. Yeah. And that's the same thing with literally everything out there. That's the coolest part is like, 
what you just described is the same thing we do. So we we flip properties. We do the same exact thing. Find somebody who's in a situation where they're like, hey, I want to get rid of this for a lower price. We go, we put the, we fix it up and then we sell it for, for more. And it's a com- speed and convenience thing because everybody's like, why would somebody do that? Timing, speed and convenience, where they're at in their life, where the stores are at. I mean, everything, cars, same thing. What do they do? They go, they get a trade in value. The person knows they could sell it for more if they sold on the retail market, but they don't want to deal with it. So they sell for a lower price. It's the same thing, no matter what you're doing. So yeah, hopefully people realize that business, what we're talking about here is not shoes. It's not houses. It's not uh, cars. It's literally just business. So yeah, that's a great point that you made there. Yeah, it, apply, it applies across the board uh, with everything. I mean, when I buy flowers for my wife, I could go buy the seed. I could plant it out back and then I could wait for it to grow and I could give her the flowers, but the speed and convenience... I mean, I probably wouldn't grow as nice a flower as they do at the floor, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's across the board. She's not going to be as surprised either. Cause she's going to be like, I'm watching you <laughs> grow those things. I know, true story. <laughs> uh, so what would you say is the, have you looked at your KPIs and have you and your wife figured out what your main source is for the majority of your products? And then like the secondary and the, the tertiary source? Yeah. Again, we're always trying to build a business where we can go get the thing that multiplies our money seven days a week. Uh, a, a very small part of the shoe reselling business, even though it gets the most news, is like hype reselling, where you get the new release, you get lucky enough to get the new release, and then overnight the value of that shoe increases because of the scarcity of of how many shoes there is. And that's not our business at all. I mean, that's that's less than one percent of our business. Most of our business is the uh, convenience factor. So we find a source, which is, I mean, let's just use the biggest shoe brand in the world, Nike. And we look at what their business model is. Their business model is they're always new styles coming out. They also uh, are producing billions of shoes every single year. They have to have a process to move inventory quickly. We look at what they're doing and we find a spot where we can come in and be valuable to them by buying the shoes low enough in, in a marketplace to then present them in a marketplace where there's more value. And so what I mean by that is, They've got their flagship store where everything's retail. If a shoe retails for 200 bucks and you go into that store, everything's going to be 200 bucks. But for the pairs that don't sell, they move on to their outlets. In their outlets, they have tiered discounts. It'll be 149, then it'll be 129, then it'll be 99. And sometimes you can get even get a $200 shoe for less than $50. That's where we come in as resellers and say, all right, we'll scoop up all the stuff that hasn't sold. So you can have new stuff that comes in under $50. We have a $200 retail shoe. We can then sell for $99, $129, where the buyer that buys from us is getting a deal because it's a $200 shoe. We're more than doubling our money and, and everyone wins. So we get the majority of our inventory from the big name brands through their discount system that is offered to the public and then just move them into a marketplace that's more convenient for people that don't want to drive around the country uh, to go to all those locations. Then the second and third comes into buying from other resellers that maybe uh, don't want to do as much volume or are maybe getting out of the business. We'll buy a bunch of inventory from them or resellers much, much bigger than us who are focusing on different types of shoe inventory. We'll come in and buy the stuff that they're not as interested in anymore and do the same exact thing. Are you letting deals fall through the cracks because you don't have good systems in place? We've been there before and honestly, we've tried several different CRMs and RE Simply has been the absolute best. RE Simply tracks your KPIs, does automatic follow-ups for you, and even records incoming phone calls. The system is very easy to use, and honestly, it has more features than we even know what to do with. If you're looking for a great CRM, try RE Simply today. Click the link in the description below. Check it out now. What is your average, uh, well, I'll ask a different question first, actually. For somebody who's just getting started, obviously that's not the model that you're going to use for them because they might not have like, you know, 10 grand to put toward a lot of different pairs of shoes. And so if I was like a 16 year old kid who was like, hey, man, I want a side hustle. What would you tell me about getting started? You know, would you be like, hey, go to Goodwill? Hey, go to garage sales, you know, go to Facebook Marketplace and look for ones that were like poorly marketed. You know, what would you that guy. This is where, so that I'll give you a very specific answer based on what we did, but there's like a pride, there's a pride to this answer, meaning 
most that example you use the 16 year old normally they want to sell the hype shoe <laughs> so they want, they want to buy the new release Jordan one, which is very hard to buy at a, at a, a cost low enough where you're going to make any kind of margin. So you have to be willing to sell the shoes that aren't as hype. And what I would do is just that, which we did, which is we started with the shoes in our closet and to build relationships, we sold them for $25 a pair on Facebook marketplace, local delivery. So we were meeting people at the grocery store. We we're meeting people at the post office. We were meeting people at the police station that has like a, a designated parking spot for online, you know, meetups. And we were selling our shoes. We'd build a relationship. We'd get money in hand. Uh, and people knew we were reselling shoes. Then you've got a little bit of money in hand. Then we started going to the thrifts and trying to find the pairs uh, that were under $10. We would hand clean them, you know, a little, little water. Uh, and then we would sell those for $25. So the first model was buy under $10, hand clean, sell for $25 do that a thousand times over and over and over and over again. Then there's people in your local area that know you are into shoes that are, know you're a shoe reseller. Then you've got a, a little bit of money in your pocket and you put in the sweat equity to, and your, your mistakes are very financially risk. They're, the financial risk of your mistakes is very low. Then you start getting into uh, outlets where the pairs might cost, you know, 30, 40, $50, but you can double your money and make a little bit more money per pair, but you've got all the experience in how to move the, move that inventory. And slowly but surely you test all the marketplaces, eBay, Poshmark, whatnot, um, Mercari, and you see which one you like to use the best that you enjoy using and you build on that one. Cause the reality is there's people doing monster businesses on all of them. You don't, there's not one that's better than the other. You just got to use the ones that you enjoy. So start, very, very financially risk low, but heavy on the sweat equity and slowly but surely respect every dollar bill that's coming in and out in order to grow a very long-term successful business. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Gary V is big on flip life. Uh, I know actually that you attended FlipCon. We just had Harry Tornado on uh, Joshua Varnell, who was like one of our last podcasts. He's a super cool guy. How, how was FlipCon? What did you take away from that? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, this is our second year being invited to, to speak at FlipCon. Uh, Josh and Haley, uh, you know, are amazing, amazing couple uh, doing doing big things in, in categories, obviously on YouTube, obviously on reselling and obviously on event planning. Um, anytime you can go shoulder to shoulder with people that are have similar interests and are doing it in the same category, it's always beneficial. I mean, in person and which is what FlipCon was. I mean, there was hundreds and hundreds of people there now. Everyone had different strategies. Everyone had different uh, marketplaces they were using. But to the the gold was sitting at the table next to the person and saying, like, how are you doing what you're doing? Um, as opposed to listening to the people like Lindsay and I that were, you know, on stage talking about stuff. I mean, everything we shared there when we were on stage is the same thing we share through our social media. So the important parts in the of that type of event is you know, when you're eating breakfast, lunch, or dinner next to the person who's, you know, from Missouri that you're never going to bump into at the grocery store saying, you know, what's working for you, what's not working for you. Um, and so we spent three days there. It was absolutely phenomenal. I know they're handing off that event uh, to another group of people, and I hope they continue to, to, to run it year after year. Awesome. Uh, so I want to go back to something else that we talked about. You talked about funding. How much inventory are you holding right now? See the shelves? Nothing. Uh, we're, we're, this is what I always say. We're not in the business of storing shoes. We're in the business of selling shoes. This is slightly different than the majority uh, model, but we bring in on a slow, a slow week, we bring in 500 pairs. On a busy week, we bring in 1,500 pairs, and they're all sold in four days. Holy crap. Now, that's, that's present day. Uh, there's been, years where I had a two car garage filled with shoes, you know, there's nothing wrong with that model. It's just a different model, you know, turnaround time on, on that business model was, was 90 days or less would be our goal. Um, but our current model with live selling on whatnot has been an absolute game changer for us. Uh, you talk about speed and efficiency, like we can bring in that many pairs and sell them for good margins that quickly with live selling on whatnot. So uh, the shelves are empty most of the, most of the week. So let's talk about then when it wasn't, cause like, well, that's where we're at. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we have to borrow money in order to hold the inventory and with real estate, obviously it's, it's freaking expensive as crap, but I'm 
I'm guessing that if you did that much revenue over a million dollars that you had to have some inventory at one point, whenever yep. you were holding, what's the most inventory you ever held? And then where did you get that money from? So most to answer your first question was right around, I would say 3000 listings. So 3000 pairs at, at once. Um, now where we got that money is, is we started with the shoes in our closet and then we turned ten dollars into twenty five dollars a thousand times, and then you know we would reinvest. Our big thing, and I, this this will be valuable for people listening, is our business tells us how much shoes to go buy. So, like from the very beginning, this is where Lindsay's strength comes in. We know what our bills are every single month, and in the beginning, the goal was just to like hit the bills. So as money came in, you just divide that monthly number by four, so you know how much money you got to put away each week. We'd put the money away. And then after that money was put away each week, we know, okay, we've got X amount to go buy more shoes. Then as you get better at buying shoes and multiplying your money, that number grows and it gets easier and easier to pay all your bills. Then you say, all right, I'm going to pay all my bills and put some money away in savings or put some money away in investments. And then everything that's left over is, is um, put into more shoes. Now, if you don't have any money left over, if you don't, if you can't pay the bills, that's where you go into and say, look at the inventory you're purchasing and you got to get better with that. So, um, in terms of money to start, I mean, it's not a joke. I'm not trying to make, like, we didn't, we had no money. Our buying budget, once we started selling shoes was like 20 or 30 bucks a week. And so we would get real good at spending that money and multiplying it in the, you know, the less than $10 to $25 model. Um, present day, it's the same thing, except we're spending tens of thousands of dollars on shoes every single week and then multiplying it up um, in a four day period. So I'm, you said the 16 year old example, we do get, we do get young people and sometimes uh, older people like myself that will reach out and be like, Hey, I just spent $10,000 on shoes. I'm going to test this whole reselling thing out. And I'm like, wait, you ought, you just spent 10. It's like someone saying, Hey, I'm going to try this house flipping thing. I just bought a house for $1.2 million in a crappy neighborhood. And you're like, what? Why? Like, did you check comps on the houses around it? Did you check the foundation? And they're like, no, no, I just bought it. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be worth more. And you're like, oh God, we got to, we got to back up. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate? It's not like what you see on HGTV. We created a course to show you how to really invest and create a profitable flipping and wholesaling business. We show you where to find the money, how to find the deals and how to negotiate the deals. We go over live sales calls, including negotiations, scripts, role playing, and so much more. Everything that you need to know to flip houses is in this course. And if there's a video that we didn't make that you want, we'll make it for you. This knowledge has made us well over a million dollars and it's available right now for $9.97. Click the link below, buy the course. It's funny. It's so funny how it seems like, so there's two different mentalities and I feel like, um, Dakota and I are fighting this when it comes to us talking to resellers because you guys understand the principles behind a flipping, yet for some reason, so far, we've talked to two resellers, you guys say, stay so cash safe that we look at it and go like, oh man, you could have scaled this business so far if you were just willing to leverage debt and push, like you could have 50 employees and like you could be making your own shoes at this point. <laughs> But at the same time, you guys are in a spot where like you can't fail. You could just see one of your revenue streams kind of go to crap and then you have to start another one. It's just to us, it feels like you're farther away from absolute freedom because you haven't leveraged enough to like retire in a year, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think there is tremendous value in using other people's money, you know, to grow your business and leveraging debt. And I think the reason you don't hear enough, enough of that, I do think it's a very strong point that should get across in the reselling world is because most resellers are not good at the basics. So like if you gave a reseller $10,000 and you taught them the model, they would just buy the wrong shoes. They'd list them the wrong way. They'd so like most of the time now, I'm, I'm, I promise you there's resellers much, much bigger than me that do exactly what you're saying. They leverage other people's debt in order to build, you know, a monster business. I mean, I know a guy out of New Hampshire cause we're based out of Maine and he's got multiple teams that go up and down the East coast. He's doing, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year. I'm sure he's not using his own money in order to do that. And I'm sure he's got that. So like where we're headed, I think, uh, is that direction, but I, I really do love the mentality of, 
you know, when a couple dollars goes out, it we're very strategic with that. There's no like loosey goosey. And it's also our money. So it's, it's, if it's going to go for a pair of shoes, I promise you it's going to go for a shoe, a pair of shoes. That's going to multiply our money tremendously. Now, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll pass it on is also most resellers, uh, don't want to have 50 employees. They just like, like we had a warehouse, we had a bunch of employees. And then we were just like, man, I'd rather just walk downstairs and build a business. Now we didn't think we could build this big of a business out of our basement. So we do have employees that go out and source for us. We do have employees that do X, Y, and Z, but, um, cause it, if you want to build a multi-million dollar business, you have to do that. Um, but we're barreling towards that, uh, what, what you're talking about, which is leveraging other people's money. I mean, we're about to do a deal uh, next week where we're going to have 200,000 units come in. Someone else has purchased the inventory. We're going to move it. We're building out a team to move it for us. So like, it's similar to what you guys are talking about. It's transitioning into that phase. Awesome. How many pairs of shoes do you take a loss on then? If you get rid of them in four days, are you taking a loss on absolutely no shoes? Or are you like, okay, we're 75% profitable and we'll take a loss on this 25% of our inventory? It's a great question. And what I'm about to describe is, is I'm, I'm hearing is very foreign in the shoe reselling world, because the reality is it's about, it's about money in money out, right? Like, so we let, let's just use whole numbers. If we spend $10,000 on inventory in a week, we get X amount of shoes. We'll bring back in, uh, you know, on average $18,000 after fees, after paying the team, you know, we'll turn $10,000 out into $18,000 back in. But some of those shoes we purchased for $40 and we sell for 20. And so people, when they see that one shoe, which is to the respect of your question, they'll be like, you just lost $20. But there's this whole lineage. We learned this from Nike. In the $200 retail example, I can buy a $200 shoe sometimes for $29 from Nike. Now, of course, Nike's probably... It, you know, it takes probably well, like $4 to make that shoe. So they're not actually losing money. But some when you see a $200 retail selling for $29, you're like, I don't understand. Because they've sold it so many times at $200 that it pays for all the inventory they have left. So all the inventory they have left is basically pure profit. And that's the way we look at it. The first half of our four day week is selling things at a premium. And then the rest of it is just moving it as quickly as we can to build more relationships. And then that creates the whole flywheel to move it quicker. So I can go into more detail about that, but the reality is we don't lose money week after week because we're very strategic on how we sell and we're very strategic on the inventory that we bring in. Pulling data lists like vacant houses, mortgage foreclosures, and tax delinquent properties is important to direct to seller marketing. Batch Leads is the main platform where we store our sellers data and skip trace owners for their phone numbers, emails, and addresses. On other platforms, you end up having to pay twice for the same contact if you've already skip traced it. My favorite thing about batch leads is that if you skip traced a contact once, you never have to pay for that contact again. Batch leads has SMS texting campaigns, direct mail marketing, and driving for dollars app integrated in a simple to use interface. Click the link below and try batch leads today. Uh, I want to talk about that because you, you gave an example about buying a $1.2 million house in a crappy neighborhood. And we see a lot of other people who are new to this too. And again, it's all about buying things for the right price, no matter what business you're in. If you're buying and selling, it's all about buying for the right price. So with real estate, it's a little bit easier, you know, Hey, look at the condition, how much the repairs are. There's comps. You find one with similar square footage with shoes. How do you know which one's going to sell? How do you know which one's going to be a good one? And how do you like hedge your bet of like, Hey, I know I'm buying this right. So it, 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 there's a lot of data to back it up. I mean, there are marketplaces like StockX and Goat that will help you with, uh, you know, market value. But the reality is there's a different value on each marketplace for that shoe because of the buyers that are there. I, I can assume and I, I'm just making this up with very little knowledge about house flipping, but like I see stuff pop on Instagram where like you can buy for $500,000, you can buy this type of house in Texas. But when it's in New York, it's like, mm -hmm. For $500,000, you can barely get a, a, a nice apartment. So like, it's very similar with shoes. And I think the, the phrase you just said is like, how much you buy the shoe for is very, very important. So I could have a pair of Jordan 1 reverse breads, right? Um, where I buy them for 60 and another re from one marketplace, a, the outlet. I'll say I buy them from the outlet for $60. 
uh, another reseller might go to a sneaker event and buy them for 120, right? We both sell them for $120. I double my money, that person gets their money back. So like how much you buy the shoe matters. And now this is where good resellers, they find the markets where the undervalued assets are. As I'm assuming good house flippers, you find the undervalued asset in that marketplace, fix it up or find the buyer that, you know, connects the convenience, whether it's a, a doctor moving in to work at the new hospital that's, you know, wants a nice house that's right next to it, where you just bought it from the person who's lived there for 40 years and doesn't even know the hospital's there. There's, there's the arbitrage. It's the same thing with shoes. Like, the mom does not actually want to drive around to all the outlets to find shoes for her kids. So if I can provide her a good price point where I make a little bit of money and she gets convenience, then the whole, the whole wheel keeps spinning. So do you look at like, I guess I'm asking how to comp a shoe. Yeah. Do you look at like uh, what mm -hmm. Nike sells it for new and that's how you know. And like, what if you buy one that's yellow and freaking ugly as crap and nobody wanted it, but that's why it's discounted because nobody wants it. So how do you comp a shoe basically? Yeah, you, you put in the reps, you use the, the data available. So like eBay, for example, is very good about showing you sales data. This shoe has sold for this much in this condition, you know, consecutively over the last 90 days for this much. Okay. eBay is great about providing that data. Other marketplaces are not. So you have to do a little bit harder research. You go look at sold comps on Poshmark, for example, and just look at what the actual sales are. Uh, when we first started on Facebook marketplace, it was literally, we just priced everything at $25 and people would, you know, now listen, we were selling Jordans for $25 because we were trying to build relationships, but, uh, there's lots of different ways. And then it's just about tracking your own data. I mean, I'm sure over time you as house flippers know, like, you know, this color, this color does best uh, for the outside of the house. You know, this, this acreage does better for, you know, this type of property, um, and then you just lean into that data rather than trying to reinvent the wheel all the time. I mean, the reality is there's a more, there's a bigger buying pool that fits into a men's 10 and a half than there is to a, a, a men's 15. Mm -hmm. So like, if you're going to spend your money on one or the other, you're going to have more people wanting to buy your men's 10 and a half than your men's 15. So very generally speaking, that's, that's, we just use data both that we keep track of and data that's provided by the marketplaces based on what all the other resellers are doing. So when you're uh, developing these relationships with your customers, you're asking for five star reviews and you're asking them to like type things out. And of course, you're like trying to like help them out if something happened and the shoes were damaged or whatever, you give them their money back and then you go through the process of getting it refunded to you. Now that you're selling a lot more volume, are you feeling those things start to fall through the crack or have you created systems to like get those five star reviews and troubleshoot problems? How are you staying on top of it? Uh, being very good and consistent at the basics. We don't source shoes that are damaged and we have a whole, you know, system on making sure they're not damaged before they go out the door. There's no little rips or tears. Um, you know, we moved into doing all new shoes last year, so that makes it a lot easier. Um, there's still a system to check everything before it goes out the door. Uh, we also use marketplaces that take care of sellers that are being honest about their business. So, Live selling on whatnot. I'm going to keep talking about whatnot because that's where we sell 100% of our shoes. It's a live selling marketplace. It's absolutely phenomenal. It changed our business for sure. Because it's live video, because all the shoes are brand new and I'm showing you and, and everything's recorded on video, all you got to do is just be honest. Like here's, here's a pair of Nike Air Max. They're a men's 10 and a half. Here's the model. They're beautiful. Uh, here's the price and people buy them. There's no need for like, oh, I got these shoes and they were damaged. I got these shoes and they, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now, whatnot takes care of their sellers that are being honest. So if someone's like, oh, I'm just not feeling it. I want to return them. Whatnot's like, no, uh, you can't do that. They, they sent you exactly what you wanted to order. But if you want to resell them yourselves, you know, sign up to sell on whatnot and you can do it, blah, blah, blah. So like, of course, we take care of our customers uh, as, as it's the number one priority. But you also got to make sure that you're being honest with your business. If you're like doing a lot, like if I'm trying to sell you a pair of shoes, I mean, we all the shoes are sold right now, but like you guys get it. Like, like if I got a pair of shoes and I'm, I take, I'm going to take these off because I was doing a little yard work. These are a pair of like waterproof vans. Now these are used, but if I'm like, if I'm holding them back here on the live video and I'm like, these are brand new. Look, they're brand new. You can, and I'm not like showing you and blah, blah, blah. And then when they get them, they're like, wait, you use these. Like that's obvious business. Like you guys aren't selling 
houses that have huge cracks in the foundation and you know they're brand new nothing's wrong with the foundation so as long as you're just honest with your business there's enough really good buyers out there that uh you'll be able to grow your business uh very quickly you ever do that you're like all right guys hey i got this shoe right here oh this one's actually got a little snag in it so this one's got a snag in it i'll give you five dollars <laughs> well i'll actually take it right off uh i won't sell it and oh. and, and that exact thing has happened in the past that you saying that on video or with your listing or whatever, like is super important. Now I'll take the hit because I do have a whole system in place to check that stuff before it gets to where I'm on video with it. But every once in a great, great while I'll, that'll happen. And I'll be like, you know what? I can't sell this to you because it's, there's, it's damaged or whatever. And people are like, Oh, he, he's serious about his business. He's going to lose money on that shoe instead of trying to, you know, pass it on to me. Now, that's a whole nother uh, conversation where selling shoes that are damaged, you absolutely can. There, there are people that buy it, but imagine you guys are the house resellers that sell a house with a cracked foundation in Hey guys, there's a cracked foundation. There's a huge crack in the foundation. It's probably not going to last two years. You're telling the buyers, you're telling how many times is that buyer going to then go tell their friends that they, you guys sold them a house with a cracked foundation, even if they knew. Like, yeah, that just doesn't make sense. So it's the same thing with shoes. Like we, we make sure everything's uh, up and up. Yeah, we do, we do sell them with crack foundations, but we sell them to other investors and then we just let them know exactly what you said. So like for me, <clears throat> firstly, we would still sell it. We just disclose everything. Hey, and we actually have them signed too, obviously, because housing is a little bit different than shoes, but I would still sell a shoe as damaged as long as I, the other person knows. But like, I always tell people, whatever you believe is ethical and be like, whatever you want, that's what you need to do. I feel okay with selling a shoe that would be messed up as long as the person knows exactly what's wrong with it and they still want it. I'm like, all right, Hey, I'll still sell this to you. If this is what you want, I'm okay with that. Same thing with houses, obviously. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I always tell people though, do whatever you feel honest and ethical with. And then I had a question about this actually, because something that we do run into is very similar to what you talked about. You said, all right, we do the basics. We do the basics really well. We, we freaking have these systems. We have these processes. I make sure that everything is all freaking, you know, great. And there's no problems. And then you get on, get up there and you're like, mother what? effer. And like, you know, you're like, you're just like, so what, what, what happens in that moment? Do you get mad at your team? Do you get mad at the process? Do you go back and read like what goes on in your mind and what's the next steps that you take after that? Well, I mean, I'm going to lean into Gary, Gary V. I mean, everything's my fault. I'm, I'm running the business. Everything's my fault. If, if it made it through all that, I hired the person that is in charge of doing all that. I trained the person that is in charge of, of all those filters. So then I just go back to how can I support that part of the system in a way where it doesn't happen again, but it's hundred percent my fault. Um, I mean, to the point where when we get messages, I got my shoes in the box and the box is wet. I'm like, well, it's my fault that it rained that day. And your post office dropped it off and left it out in the rain. And I'll say, listen, you know, when we sent it, it wasn't wet, but what can I do to, you know, make this right? And then they, they realize like, oh, you're, you don't control the weather. <laughs> so like, Control the controllables and take ownership if it's your business. Um, and I think that's the easiest way to continue to grow. And here's the last thing I'll say. Like, if you're hearing all, all three of us talk about this, we also know that nothing's perfect. Like, the reality is we don't have a perfect business. There's lots of stuff that we need to improve. We're trying our best. Uh, and it's growing continuously. But, like, we're never going to have a per perfect business. There's always going to be things that uh, happen. And we just try to not repeat the same mistakes. Um, and we're also not heart surgeons like if i was a heart surgeon and i made a mistake i'd i'd be a little harder on myself but we're shoe resellers you know we're house flippers at the end of the day there's going to be more shoes and more houses mm -hmm. so you got a podcast and you got uh, an instagram page you've grown quite a bit um do you think that you'll lean more into social media in the future do you see how well it works for Harry Tornado and go like, oh, maybe i'll just be a youtuber and then have this be my side business where i sell shoes <laughs> I mean, maybe I think uh, uh, Josh and Haley are great examples of how to build something from scratch on YouTube. They've done very, very well. They're continuing to do well. They're continuing to grow. Lindsay and I have do we do have big plans uh, for our shoe reselling business. There is a plateau that we want to reach, which is the business is running by itself and it's pumping out uh, X amount of dollars per month continuously. Very predictable. Um, so we do have a goal with our shoe reselling business. When we hit that goal, we're going to have a tremendous amount of free time. We'll only be able to, we'll only need to manage the uh, top touch points of the business. And then we'll look into, 
you know, do we want to build a YouTube business? Do we want to build uh, another kind of business? Do we want to just hang out with our kids and, you know, travel around? But we, the answer is possibly. Now we do look at it that way. It is uh, social media as a business, social media. We don't look at it as, you know, I'm not, I'm not online bickering with people about the presidents. I'll say, you know, you know, I look at social media as a way to connect with people all around the country in a way that would otherwise be impossible. And so how can I do that in the most efficient way, build genuine relationships um, for the right reasons? If I'm going to build a YouTube channel, I'm not going to build it. Uh, I'm not going to build it in anything other than a business sense. I guess that's the way. So eventually, yes, right now, no. Well, you kind of got that like a uh, skateboarder troublemaker like whistle and diesel look you know maybe you could just like burn some shoes or something <laughs> well listen this is this is because uh winter's coming in maine and it gets cold up here so <laughs> I, I gotta i gotta stay warm you know i call it the hockey lettuce the hockey hair uh it's also um i'm turning 40 in october and so like my priorities of uh, of certain things have changed over the years now that I have one kid and the second on the way. I mean, I thought I was motivated before I had kids. And now with one and the second on the way, like talk about motivated to do the right thing and create efficiencies. But but believe me, I do. My sister, uh, who's the the humor of our whole family, my little sister is, is got a big social media following, makes a tremendous amount of money. Uh, so there is a world where I can see, you know, jumping into that and being goofy online to, to make a lot of money so with uh um what we were talking about earlier is you talked about this business you know and then you're only doing like kind of sounds like you're doing one thing and you're doing it really well and then we're asking about future and stuff like that how important do you think it is because to me it sounds like you just know business very well and you're like a business guy but you're in shoes and that's the way I kind of see myself is I'm a business guy, but I'm in real estate. It's not like real estate is the only thing that I know. Once you learn this stuff, you learn the shoes, it can go into real estate, it can go in all this stuff. But are, do you think it's important to niche down and like just choose one thing and do it really well? Or are you like, you know, are you thinking, all right, hey, I'm going to spread my wings and go into multiple different things? Here's how I'll answer, man. I promise you LeBron James wasn't going to the hockey rink when, you know, as he was growing up. It would probably be fun to put on the skates and like go skate around, but I'm sure the most of his time was, you know, shooting baskets and and training and building up the muscles that would uh, allow him to be an absolute same thing with Michael Jordan. I mean, this is a whole nother podcast, but like Michael Jordan playing baseball was not the prettiest sight. Okay. Like often now, right. Right. Oh, now, he played now it's, oh yeah, no, He's like, 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 like here's what I'll say it's a lot of fun to resell a lot of different stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do multi-million dollar business out of your basement, it's a lot easier to do that by niching down. Now, do I, am I telling you, you have to do it in shoes? No, but you can pick whatever category you, you enjoy and you can absolutely build a monster. And then with respect to what you said, once you see that, once you, and you guys have seen it, obviously I, I can assume once you see it, then you start seeing how it can be done in all these other niches. Then it's just about the discipline of growing and being focused until you build that that uh, machine that pumps out enough profit to then apply it in other businesses. And we absolutely will. I mean, I I right now could build a monster uh, tank top reselling business. I'm just not like super passionate about tank tops. <laughs> I'm like I'm like passionate about shoes. And so when we build the business up to where we want to do, I'm going to see what, what else I'm passionate about and, and use the same business principles to, to build in that category. Yep. And uh, if you decided to uh, buy any real estate, it would probably still be a great decision because yeah, <laughs> yeah. Way that we're, we're seeing like massive inflation hit all the markets. Like the Midwest is not known for any kind of appreciation and we've seen our properties go up in value recently just because of all the money that's been printed during COVID. And then afterwards, like having supply chain issues and things like that. So if you accidentally ended up buying some real estate, Ryan, it wouldn't be that bad of a deal. Just uh, get a property manager. So that way you don't have to deal with it at all. It's like a passive thing, you know? Well, listen, to re that's the plan, you know, is to, to buy property, to buy land and then put people in place to kind of run that part of the business for us. Um, so that that's that's the mid range, mid to long term range. Short term is create that shoe reselling business that pumps the money uh, into um, that.
Yeah, I think that's a great strategy. And I was thinking about that realistically. Most people become millionaires um, from a business, from one niche business, you know, and then you always hear that, yo, they have all these different streams of incomes. I feel like that's whenever you start to get to like deca millionaire, whenever you're starting to get over 10 million, that's when you have multiple different streams and stuff and you really start to create that. I think first, in order to even become a millionaire to start, you have to have your niche business um, first. And so actually that reminds me, we always like to ask people like what their net worth is. And so do you have a calculator or you keep it all track of all that stuff? Do you know what your net worth is? No, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, I know. I know we've got more, more money in the bank than we need. Uh, but I have no idea how to figure out exactly. I mean, I'm sure my wife does. This is where her strength is, but I have no idea what our net worth is. That's what I said. I was like, Lindsay, Lindsay knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, the coolest part is, yeah, real estate, I think, uh, definitely helps your net worth go up way faster than anything else. So if anybody does decide that they cannot just niche down and do one thing, what, what Tony was basically talking about, what we always suggest is buy something like real estate. Just don't let it take up your time. Buy it and forget about it. If you got to go over there and you keep checking up on it, you're mowing the lawn or you're doing it like, what the frick? No, focus on your business that makes you money and then go and invest in that and put it to the side and don't think about it again is basically the place that you want to be at to get extremely wealthy i think so yeah i i could agree with that and i'm i'm naive uh to the verbiage and to some of the education behind that but i've i mean that principle is true when it comes to land and stuff that they're not making any more of it's like it's gonna go up yep. you know do you know what your house is worth you have an idea we bought it at like 310 uh two years ago and i think when Lindsay uh last looked it was worth over four okay. so like What's your, uh, besides that, do you have any other property? Not yet. We're working on number property number two. We're, we're thinking either Carolinas or Florida, just because we do a lot of traveling up and down, but okay. not yet. Yeah. With, with your money in the bank and your property, you're probably worth more than half a million net worth wise. I mean, I don't even know. Is that good? And all I know is like, I don't have to worry about putting food in the fridge. I don't have to yeah. worry. Like uh, the car breaks down. We got money to pay. You know, we're good. Here's the funniest part about net worth. I, I don't think net worth actually matters at all. Uh, it's almost irrelevant. But what is important is like what you're talking about is cash flow. And so net worth is like, you know, we you could be worth freaking five million today and then the market tanks and now you're worth two million. So like, right, right. you know, it, so it's it's kind of uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, at the end of the day, but uh, I think that cash flow is the most important. And that's what I always want to tell people. Uh, this is more of a real estate podcast. It's overall everything. But uh, whenever you're buying real estate, buy it for cash flow. That way it does not matter what happens in the market. It's basically what we do other places. You know, if you're buying in Vegas, California stuff, they do buy for appreciation. I think it's risky, but that's just me personally. I would say buy for cash flow. That way you can live the way that you're talking about. You live the life you want to live because net worth doesn't put any money in the bank unless you sell your assets. Yeah. So I, I like what you just said there. Like you want to, my, my, the thing my dad taught me all the time was, you know, roof over your head, shirt on your back, food in your belly. You know, if, if you've got that stuff covered and you're not worrying about getting that stuff covered, then you're in a very good place. Now I'm also not naive to say like, Oh sweet. I got bread and cheese. Like everything's good. Like we do have money in the bank. We do, uh, we are starting to educate ourselves a lot more now that the business is pumping out a lot more money than we need every single month. Like we're covered for the next couple of years. If another, like, God forbid, if another pandemic weird thing happens where like everything shuts down, we're covered for years and years with the the stuff that means uh, a lot to us, roof over our head, shirt on our back, food in our belly. But we're starting to educate ourselves, um, you know, uh, with information about making the most out of our money. It, it doesn't make sense to just have it. You know, <laughs> I don't feel comfortable with like a bunch of money underneath my pillowcase just because I can buy bread and cheese. But like we're, we're getting better about um where to put it so it appreciates and then you know generations that are coming up behind us our kids 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 can can take advantage of that so uh you talked a little bit about your relationship i assume that your relationship with your wife is pretty good uh yeah. what relationship advice would you give our listeners uh when we when we first started dating i was extremely honest about who i was and everything from the beginning and and i think that's important you're usually when you're dating you're trying to like at least as a man, you're trying to like 
present yourself as as something maybe more appealing than you actually are. And I was I I got stripped myself down to the very bare minimum saying this is who I am. This is like what I believe in. This is kind of where I think I'm going. And because of that, I attracted, you know, someone else that that wanted that in their life as opposed to pretending to be something that I wasn't that attracted someone who thought I was something different and then I, it was hard to be myself. So Continuing to be honest uh, with your partner is super important. And sometimes life changes and you have different uh, ways. And so Lindsay and I are always very conscious. We wake up every morning. Are we still enjoying this? And if as long as we both say yes, then we continue to do it. If there's ever a morning in the future that comes up and we're like, man, I'm just not one of us is just not feeling it anymore. Then the business will change and we'll maneuver. But uh, just being super and so, I'm saying these words. It's, sometimes it's very hard to be very honest because like you don't want to say something that well whoa, what if they don't like me as much or what if you know they don't like what i'm saying but that the long-term goal and the long-term good strategy is just continuously being honest with how you're feeling and what what's going on in your mind um no matter what you've got a little girl i know it's it's difficult now that she's too like necessarily giving a bunch of advice because you're what she just like right is this bundle of joy that's like her she feels something and then she like immediately expresses it you know emotionally and that sort of thing she's in the downloading information phase right now do you feel like you've got any parenting advice for that like zero to two years old range i mean i don't know if i feel comfortable calling it advice but i'll share my experience uh because like there's a lot of different ways to parent um i'm a big advocate of or here's what here's what i'll say i'll, I'll be i'm not going to be good at disciplining I'm not good at this is right. This is wrong. I'm I'm way better at like, how is this making you feel? Do you, you know, like, for example, if she falls down, sometimes it's a real fall, like, a, like, holy smokes, you're probably hurt. And sometimes it's, well, that was scary for a second. I'm not really hurt. So instead of saying like, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay, okay whatever, I'll just be like, are you okay? Are you okay? You know, is anything hurting? And then after a couple seconds, if it's a uh, if it's a scary fall, but not one that hurts, it's like, oh no, I'm actually okay. If it's one that hurts, it's like, no, I'm hurting and they hurt, my elbow hurts or I'm hurting in my face. You know, I fell on my face. My daughter fell on her face the other day at one of the camps that we're at. And I was like, I could, I could see that it hurt visually, but I was like, are you okay? Are you okay? What hurts? And so I guess um, this is going to sound weird, but communicating with them almost as if they're older than they are allows them to kind of learn how to communicate in a right way. Um, I'm also finding that two-year-olds are testing the boundaries of how, how their emotions. So she'll like start crying and then look at me to see if I'm responding a certain way. And then she'd be like, Oh, that didn't work. So she'll, she'll, <laughs> she'll stop crying. Um, but I, 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 the same thing goes with your partner, like being honest with them. Hey, you know, that's not allowed or Hey, uh, you know, it's bedtime or just being very communicative and uh, honest it has worked well for me as a dad so far. I thought maybe Lindsay started crying and then looked at you to see if it was working. <laughs> well, hey, now I know where my daughter got it. So. <laughs> Dude, I was listening to a, a, a podcast or maybe just a reel or whatever. So it's interesting as you say, how does this make you feel? And so and then you ask uh, you ask your wife the same thing every morning, like, hey, how are you feeling? Um, so he was basically talking about life is not as complex or as difficult as we like to make it really all it comes down to the emotions that we're experiencing. And what are things that make us feel those emotions? How can we make ourselves feel a certain way? So he talks about the quality of the life is the quality of the emotions that you have. And so yeah, it's just interesting that you're teaching her that at such a young age, I'm like, hey, how do you feel? How does this make you feel? And then yeah, you want to create different feelings, which like that one is manipulation. So it's interesting if you manipulate in order to get yourself to feel a certain way, is that effective and stuff? So yeah, I think that's just really cool and interesting that you're, you're like, you are experiencing that in two different relationships, but there's also, there's also people can have different emotions because they have different data that backs up that emotion. Like uh, a two-year-old is still trying to figure out like what is scary and what hurts. Like she, one one child might slide down the hill and think it's fun. One child might slide down the hill and be like, that was the that was terrible. That was horrible. I thought I was going to die. And so, you know, what type of information people are absorbing dictates usually the uh, the emotion or the outcome. And same thing in business, like some houses look better than others. So what information do you have that allows you to make the decision? Same, some shoes uh, are different than others. So 
having, uh, being, understanding what data people are using to make the decisions that they make is important. And sometimes it's like you said, it's as easy as like, what, how are you feeling? What, why, you know, what, what data are you using to make this decision? Whether you're frustrated, whether you're happy, um, do you have different data than I do that causes you to feel this way? Cause I feel a different way. And then once you have the same data coming in, um, it's easier to communicate. What is your biggest struggle right now, Ryan? Um, my biggest struggle is, uh, this is going to sound corny and I, I hope, I hope it doesn't, but it's going to sound corny is like, we're, we're almost, we're six or seven years into the shoe reselling thing. And I don't, I still don't think I've grasped like how big it is, like, like, like the opportunity. For example, our moonshot business what we thought would be like the most amazing thing we've ever built. And it was a thousand dollars in sales a day. Right. I thought, man, if we could ever 10 years down the road, build a business that would just pump, sell a thousand dollars in shoes a day. And now we like regularly have 15, 16, $17,000 days. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and I'm like, what was I thinking back then? Like, and I don't even think we've really, really scratched the surface. I mean, we only do a certain types of shoes. Like, so I guess the corny weakness is like I seeing a bigger picture of what is possible. I mean, even talking to you guys, I, my my mind is spinning in a good way. Like plenty of people have reached out to us and want to leverage their money you know, to have us grow. And we've always been stubborn not to. So like realizing how big this opportunity is and being able to grasp uh, and put systems in place to take advantage of it is probably my weakness right now. Yeah, we had a similar thing where we were like, yeah, we're just going to get 80 properties and then we're just going to, you know, have enough residual income to kind of live off of it, but not live like kings or anything, but just like live the way that we'd like to. That way we have time freedom so we can do the things that we'd like to do kind of thing. And then as the business started to grow, we started looking at the numbers. Dakota was kind of like, man, uh, our rental properties don't make as much money as you'd think. Once you get turnover, once you work in some things, even if you buy them really well, they just don't make as much money as you would expect. So really rental properties are to help you build your net worth. You know, you have a nest egg for later and they sort of help you defer your taxes or reduce your total taxable income. And they're a good strategy for wealth creation and generational wealth. But like we started to figure out that flipping and wholesaling was going to be a lot more profitable. We just needed to hire sales guys so that Dakota didn't have to do sales all the time. We needed to hire a project manager so that Dakota didn't have to talk to the construction crews every single time we needed to pay out. And so our business in five years has gotten to the point where like last month we bought 43, was it 43? Something like that, yeah. 43 properties last month, 43 units total. That's great. Well, so what, what it, I love hearing that because like, I love hearing the whole process that you just said, rather than we thought 80 would be enough. We bought 43 last month, you know, the business, like I love seeing the whole process. And I think whoever's listening, that's important is when, when you think big, it allows you to go through that process in order to find out, holy smokes, this little turn that I'm going to do right here is actually going to produce X, Y, and Z. We, I used to think we, we would have to have 100,000 listings in order to make a ton of money. And then I we made that one little switch with live selling. And now it's like most of the time we don't have any shoes on hand because like just just the process you guys just explained was uh, very valuable to me. Um, and I think it's important for everyone to hear. Yeah, I think the most important thing is to have a goal work it backwards, figure out how you're going to get there and start moving. And then you're going to adjust along the way and then figure out a better way. But they always say you can't steer a parked car. So you have to start moving. Uh, so you made progress. You took action. You made a plan and you started moving it. And then now it turned into way more than what you ever thought. And that's the story of every single business that's ever been created ever. Not, I, I don't feel like very many people are saying, yep, I'm going to make this. And then they hit it and then they're like, all right, well, now I'm good. No, they they thought they were going to do something and it ended up being way bigger than what they ever imagined. Yeah, I love the I love the, the parked car analogy that you just said, because like most shoe resellers think, Here's a great example because I'm staring at, you know, our little uh, label printer. Most people haven't even sold a pair of shoes and they're like, all right, I'm going to get the laser Rolo, you know, what a name, any other brand printer. And I'm like, what are you talking? You're like not even focusing on getting the car started. You're focusing on like 
all this other stuff. Um, so just getting the car moving, no matter what business you're in, is super, super important. Yeah, they're building the track before they even have a car. <laughs> they're like they're trying to get like flashy lights on the stadium before they even found the pro like it's crazy it's crazy i heard of a story of like this italian guy who wanted to build a tennis court and so he built like a blue tennis court and there's like a reason why blue tennis courts don't exist and so he was just like a multi-billionaire who was like i'm gonna build this tennis court put millions of dollars into this tennis court the stadium and everything found out that blue was like the absolute worst color for all kinds of different reasons had to rip the whole thing up and make it green so <laughs> yeah yeah sometimes yeah i don't get people it's the same thing when when we get the dms and on instagram hey i just bought a 10 i just bought ten thousand dollars in shoes and i'm like where are you gonna sell them They're like i don't know and i'm like oh my god all right we, we maybe we need to slow this car down a little bit <laughs> all right this is our last question we're coming up on an hour so i want to respect your time uh this one's a deep one might get a little emotional so you're gonna you're gonna mentally fast forward all the way to the end of your life. Let's say you're 100 years old, and you're sitting on your deathbed, and they have one final message that you give to get to give to the world, and it's undeniably you. People are like, "Oh yeah, I know Ryan would have said that. That would have been his final message to the world." It could be a sentence, a mantra, a paragraph. It could be a billboard in Times Square. It could be on your tombstone. It's your legacy. It's how people will remember you. What's your final message? Wow, it's interesting because the first thing that came to mind, which I always say, is like I'm just getting warmed up. But like, <laughs> if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm if I'm 100 years old, they're gonna be like, dude, you are seen. Like, what is wrong with you? What do you mean you're just getting warmed up? You're about to die, man. Like, you're done. Perfect. I want that on my tombstone. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, I. I'm going to go with that one. Um, I'm just getting warmed up because that does apply. I mean, there's, there's whatever you believe in, right? Like I'm just getting warmed up. It's something that I say, whenever we hit a big goal, I'm very grateful for each and every single thing that I go through each and every single day. And um, I guess if I had to pick a different one, my number two would be just enjoy, enjoy the build, whether it's you're building a relationship, whether it's you're building a business, whether you're building a family, whether you're building generational wealth, um, that's all we really do have, right? Is 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 enjoying the build. Um, I mean, there's plenty of other ways you can that I, that people much smarter than me have described that, you know. But enjoying the build is is very important. Um, we only have this moment that we have right now, which is part of the build. Like, if you're not enjoying it, then uh, what are we doing? But I, my number one, my number one, on the tube stand. Just getting warmed up. That's the funniest one we've ever had. I think. <laughs> when I was the way like, you, the way you teed it up was great because, like, in my head, that's all I could think of was like, I'm just getting warmed up. And literally, the people that know me the best, like, would laugh because I probably will say that just as I'm about to die. Like, don't worry, guys, I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> Funny because I say I was actually just talking about this morning. I say the exact opposite of that. I'm like, <laughs> we're almost done. Like, we're, it'll be a huge project. I'm like, dude, good news. Hey, we're almost there. We're almost done. Like I, I always tell myself that every time I'm going to think we're almost there. It's like, dude, you just started like five minutes ago. I know we're almost there. Like, but that's I, like a good, it's a good way to like keep yourself going. Yeah. It's like, we're almost done. We're almost done. Enjoying the build. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Dakota said before too, like, dude, this is just the beginning. Yeah. Only, only when you're looking at it from an optimistic perspective. When you're looking at it from a pessimistic perspective, the Dakota like we're almost done. <laughs> it just depends on where you are, you know. Yeah, it's very true. My dad giving situational advice where it's like you, you're always right if you just say both things a different way. Well, it's always that's true. It's always situational. When I'm working, when I'm doing physical labor, I say it's almost there. I'll, let me let me rephrase that. When I'm doing physical labor, I'm like, hey guys, good news, we're almost done. Like, dude. I went and painted my entire house. I don't know why I painted my house, but this is before I really realized like time on investment. I'm like, yeah, yeah. This thing, I'll be able to knock this out in one day. I go out there. It took me three 12 hour days. I'm like, holy, yeah. I thought I was going to knock it all out in one, but I just kept telling myself, you're almost done. You're almost there. And so yeah, yeah. Saying it. there's, there's value in both for sure. I've, I've tried to paint a house myself and now from now on, I'm not painting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, it was great talking to you, Ryan. How can our viewers get a hold of you if they want to reach out and tell you the $10,000 shoes that they bought or if they want to get better advice so that they can 
they can build a business from the ground up by skill development, selling shoes for $25 on Facebook Marketplace. Or if how, they want to buy them. How should they get a hold of you if they want to buy some shoes from you, if they want to? Yeah, I think if you want to buy shoes from me, jump, download whatnot and just look up Renzi, R-N-Z-Y. Um, if you want to ask questions about your business, we're very open. Uh, send us a DM on Instagram. It's just Renzi now, R-N-Z-Y-N-O-W. I think there's like some New Zealand based sailing team that's called Renzi. So we had to take Renzi now on, on Instagram. Um, so Renzi now on Instagram or Renzi on whatnot. Awesome. You have any final thoughts for our viewers before we log off? Well, listen, if you're listening to this, uh, the opportunity is real, whether it's houses, whether it's shoes, um, or whether it's something that you're passionate about. I mean, the, the, the arbitrage scenario that we have in the United States is unmatched. Um, you know, it's a global thing, but like, if you're listening to this in the United States, like it is absolutely insane. The business that you can grow starting from absolutely nothing. And so if it's houses that you're interested in, talk to these guys, if, if it's, uh, shoes you're interested in you can send us a dm but there's plenty of people out there um it changed our lives it changed Lindsay and i's life i mean i thought i went to college i got a degree i thought i would wear a shirt and tie until i was 60 and then i would retire and hopefully the government would give me some money every single month uh to live the rest of my life but then when i realized the opportunity that this world offers right now with the internet and uh with you know people like yourself sharing information don't set the bar low uh, we're all just getting started. <laughs> warming up. Love just it. warming up. Cool. Thanks again, man. Hey, I appreciate it. That'll be the end of it, Ryan. And uh, we'll catch you some other time. Thanks for coming on. Cool. I appreciate you guys. Hope to see you, brother. Have a great day. You as well.